Is this working okay? Yes, oh good. Well, welcome to the Patricia and Philip Frost Art Museum. I'm Jordana Pomeroy, the director, almost two years, and so glad that you are here today for this um, wonderful Stephen um, and Dorothea Green Critics Lecture Series. Um, before I start, I always wanna recommend that you think about joining as a member because you support our work here at the Frost Art Museum. Um, uh, we are also looking forward to Basel and welcoming the installation artist Judy Pfaff on December 4th. So please make a note of that. Breakfast in the Park is open to everyone and it's a lovely time to get to know the Frost Art Museum and to hear, uh, to hear Judy speak is going to be something very special. Um, I wish to thank Mariana Ramirez on our staff for organizing this, um, this uh, today's event so beautifully. Thank you, Mariana, as well as the rest of my staff who makes this all happen for you. Um, I want to recognize the chair of our board, Daniel Perrin, and the rest of the members of our leadership advisory board who are in the audience today, um, as well as our benefactors, because once again, you do support our work here at the Frost. How do I try to tell the story of Laurie Anderson? Not only one of the world's most renowned multimedia artists, but one of the most truth-seeking artists. That's the best way I could come up with that, the truth-seeking artist, in a short introduction. I can speak of her accomplishments and awards, which are impressive and many, including an honorary doctorate from the San Francisco Art Institute and a Guggenheim Fellowship for Creative Arts and Film. Anderson was awarded the 2007 Gish Prize for her outstanding contribution to the beauty of the world and to mankind's enjoyment and understanding of life. O Superman launched Anderson's recording career in 1980, rising to number two on the British pop charts and subsequently appearing on Big Science, the first of her seven albums on the Warner Brothers label. Other record releases include Mr. Heartbreak, United States Live, Strange Angels, Bright Red, and the soundtrack to her feature film, Home of the Brave, Life on, the String, on a String, as well as Homeland in 2010. Henderson has invented several experimental musical instruments that she has used in her recordings and performances, including the tape bow violin and the talking stick. Um, and we had the pleasure, not an hour ago, of hearing Laurie Anderson with members of our um, our FIU music faculty discussing, um, well, kind of a lot, really, but we saw, we talked about some 3D uh, printed instrument, and it was um, really a wonderful experience. Thank you again for doing that with for our students. Anderson has toured the United States and internationally numerous times with shows ranging from the simple spoken word performances to elaborate multimedia events. Major works include United States 1 to 5 from 1983, Empty Places in 1990, The Nerve Bible 1995, and Songs and Stories for Moby Dick. She has also presented many solo works, including Happiness, which premiered in 2001 and toured internationally through spring 2003. Anderson has published six books. I believe that's correct. Her visual work has been presented in major museums throughout the United States and Europe. As a composer, Anderson has contributed music to films by Vin Vendors and Jonathan Demme, and to dance pieces by Bill T. Jones and Trisha Brown. She is recognized worldwide as a groundbreaking leader in the use of technology in the arts. A year ago, Heart of a Dog was released to theaters and received major critical acclaim, as well as my own personal passion for the work, and I am sure many others who watched and were drawn into Anderson's meditation on love and loss. She shot much of the film herself, which gives it a distinct personal quality that reflects Anderson's prismatic perspective on life and can often feel like a confessional narration. I confess that I cried and tried not to while watching her blind dog Lola Bell play the piano. And while she is always working nonstop, one of her most recent projects was especially timely, Habeas Corpus, which debuted at New York City's Park Avenue Armory. The artwork, hard to do justice in mere words, as is frequently the case with Anderson's work, uh, inter interweaves film, sculpture, music, and video to examine the story of Mohammed El-Gharani, one of the youngest detainees at Guantanamo Bay, 
talk about relevance for our past and premonitions for our future. Anderson has said that she tries to make stories that really engage her mind. That, as an artist, it's important that if you must define yourself, stay loose, make it vague, and let your own obsession rule. Finally, Anderson and her husband Lou Reed invented three time-tested rules, which I went to sleep by last night. The first one is, don't be afraid of anyone. Number two, get a really good BS detector and learn how to use it. <laughs> Who's faking it and who is not? And number three, be really tender. And with those three rules, you're set. And I think that's the best way for me to introduce today is Stephen and Dorothea Green, critics lecturer, lecturer. Would you please warmly welcome Laurie Anderson. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. That was very kind of you. Uh, so uh, here we are, just another uh, day or two of the season of stories. And we'll see what happens uh, next in this. And I have to say it's been, um, uh, felt like a very long time uh, listening to all of these uh, candidates with their stories about um, how they see the world as it is now and um, their stories about uh, the way the world used to be and, and their stories about the way the world uh, could be in the future or, or the way it should be in the future. And uh, so we listen to all of these stories and then you know we just basically vote for uh, the person whose story we like the best. Uh, the one that seems to match our own story and, and our own view of reality is the best. So now I have a kind of undeserved, truly, really, reputation uh, as a multimedia artist, which is a completely meaningless term, really. I mean, who isn't really a multimedia artist? We're all working with equipment all the time. And, uh, but whether I, uh, but my work, whether it's paintings or film or sculpture or uh, VR, uh, is actually stories. And it's also about the way stories work. So I want to say a few words about that today, and uh, especially as they're used to describe places. And some of the places I'll be talking about are a hospital, a church, and a lake. And I'm going to start out uh, in a nod to our elections uh, in a very flat place, the Midwest, of several uh, many years ago. Um, when I was 13, I ran for president of student council in my junior high school. And this was in Illinois. And Senator Kennedy was campaigning in the Wisconsin primaries. So I wrote a letter to him. Dear Senator Kennedy, I really admire the way you're running your campaign in Wisconsin, and I'm running for president of my student council, and I, I wondered if you could just give me some advice. <laughs> About two weeks later, I got a letter, and the return address was the office of Senator Jack Kennedy, and it was postmarked Washington, D.C., and it was quite a long letter on U.S. Senate stationery. Dear Lori, I'm very glad to know that you're participating in your student government. And then there was a list of suggestions about how to run a campaign with lots of bullet points. And one of the bullet points was spend time with your fellow students and find out what they want and promise it. <laughs> in other words, don't just make your own plan and try to convince people that it's a good idea. Be, be an real representative, not an ideologue. Anyway, there are lots of other things in the letter, and it was signed sincerely, Jack Kennedy. Now, about a month later, I wrote to him again, uh, Dear Senator Kennedy, uh, I'm sorry I didn't get back to you sooner. I've been very busy. <laughs> Twelve-year-olds are such punks, you know. And I've won the election, and, and, and best wishes in your own campaign. Uh, sincerely, Laurie Anderson. Uh, but anyway, the next thing that happened was was kind of amazing. Soon after that, I, I, uh, a special delivery truck arrived at our house, and we lived out by a lake where there had never really been a special de delivery truck, so it was a very big event. And I ran to answer the door, and a man in a uniform handed me a telegram and a package. And the telegram said, congratulations on your election, Jack Kennedy. And inside, 
there was also a big box, a big white long box, and inside the box were 12 long-stemmed red roses. And of course, this was front page news in our local newspaper, the Glen Ellen News. A local girl receives roses from Senator Kennedy, and every woman in town fell in love with Jack. Now last May, I played at the Kennedy Center in, uh, as part of the celebration for the 99th birthday of Kennedy. And after the show, they gave us a book of quotations of JFK, and it was the sort of size and shape of the Chairman uh, Mao quote, that same size book. And uh, it was full of uh, the most beautiful writing about um, art and poetry and uh, these beautiful um, paragraphs about how the uh, engine and the heart of our country are art and poetry, and that's what makes our country move. So um, it, was, uh, it was then that I, I, I read that, and, and as I'm thinking of that today, I, I uh, think of what, a, what an extraordinary uh, person this was. Now, one thing uh, before we go on with the stories about places, as I was saying, I was kind of inspired by some of the candidates to uh, try out some stand-up comedy. <laughs> because, uh, you know, um, the candidates like stand-up comedians, they don't really have any equipment. They have, they have like one mic, and they just walk around the stage, and they, which is really appealing. And they, they really only have their wits to rely on. Uh, and usually they don't have slides or scripts or, or anything, no, no props. And, and usually when I do uh, work, I have a lot of equipment, and it's always breaking, and I'm on the floor with circuit boards trying to fix it, and, and then talking to the, on the phone to the tech guy in New York, and so on. But um, on the downside of the um, comedy act, I only know two jokes. So uh, I'm going to tell you the first joke right now, just get it out of the way, and so here it is. So there was an old couple, and they had always hated each other. And they couldn't stand the sight of each other, really. So uh, when they were in their 90s, they finally decided to get a divorce. And people said, why did you wait so long? I mean, why didn't you do this a whole lot earlier? And they said, well, we wanted to wait until the children died. <laughs> Now, one more story I want to tell you before we start is, is based on the ancient play, The Birds, by Aristophanes. And I was reminded of this play because of the wall that's been proposed by one of the candidates on Earth, uh, the wall for the southern border between U.S. and Mexico. And the wall will cost, well, we're not really sure exactly what the wall will cost, something like dozens of billions, you know, nobody really knows. But it is a difficult wall to uh, build because two huge rivers, the Rio Grande and the Colorado, run through the border at many places, making gigantic holes in this new proposed wall. But no worries, as Canada says, it's going to be a good-looking wall. Uh, although no one knows really what that means and what architectural standards are being applied. But I've been thinking about uh, the, the Aristophanes play because it's also a comedy about building a big wall written in 413 BC. And it, uh, for those of you who may not have read the play lately, uh, here's, a, here's a rough summary. And uh, the story starts out, and there are two poets, and they're trudging along this dusty road, and, and they're leaving Athens, and they're talking to each other, complaining about the poetry scene, and they're saying, you know, people in the poetry scene are so, you know, they're so, it's so academic, it's so fake. You know, this is 413 BC. It's just not the old days. You know, they're so shallow. There's like no, no real pizzazz. And, and they're walking along. They're dissing everyone like that. And they walk a little further into the countryside. And some birds start circling around and kind of dive bombing them once in a while. And the poets are sort of swatting them away. And suddenly one of the poets gets an idea. And he says, wait a second. I have a really good idea uh, for you birds. So he calls all the birds together uh, for a meeting, and they start arriving from all over the world. And it's like a giant meeting, big flocks of doves and some sparrows and a bunch of parrots and hawks and robins and starlings arriving in these complicated sort of swarming patterns, and a few penguins make it up from the south and so on. And he says, um, okay, so 
all you birds, listen, listen up, birds. Uh, and he's kind of like a little bit breathless, you know, the way you are when you think you have something very insightful to say. He says, hey, I have, I have this great idea, and it's an economic opportunity for all of you. And he's starting to kind of shout now because the birds are, are all squawking and cheeping and they can't really get, he can't really get their attention because they just can't focus, you know, because, they, because, you know, because they're, they're birds. <laughs> so he tries again. May I have your attention? Listen, listen up, you birds. Just settle down for a minute and I have this great idea and it's an economic opportunity for all of you. And here it is. And finally, after a while, it gets a little quieter, but the audience is still distracted, and the birds are, are, are looking around kind of nervously. You know, they're checking things out, their neighbor's size, neighbor's wingspan. You know, they're a little bit, you know, competitive. Uh, and the poet continues, so, okay, okay, so let me just ask you a simple question. When the gods come down to Earth, for whatever reason, for example, to have an affair with one of the human girls or one of the human boys, they come down through the air, down to where? And the birds are looking like really blank. <laughs> they come down to your area, your territory. And the birds are now looking quickly around at their neighbors and sure where this argument is going. And the poet continues, and another question. When they come down through your territory, do you charge them anything? In other words, do you ask them for money? No, you do not. So, okay, let me ask you another question. When humans make their sacrifices to the gods and the smoke from their fires rises up through the air, it is again coming up to where? And the birds are hesitating now. Uh, this is kind of a lot of questions. And the poet answers his own question. He says, then the smoke comes through your territory. And again, may I ask, do you charge anything for this? And the answer is no. So you are missing an economic opportunity here. So here's what you need to do. You need to build a wall between the earth and heaven. And you need to charge money for going from one place to the other. You need to set up a station where you can charge them money like a lot of money. And the birds are looking at each other and there's like a lot of unrest now in the crowd. And they're flapping their wings, they're rustling their feathers. And one of them finally says, Yes, but building a wall is, is, is work. And he pauses, getting his thoughts together. And, he, and you know, we're birds, and so we, we don't work. <laughs> you know, you're, you're familiar with that expression, right? Free as birds, you know. So, so. Um, anyway, the, the play has a pretty surprising ending, but I won't um, give it away for those of you who haven't read it or just... Don't remember it. Uh, but now, uh, of course, um, you have to read it uh, to see what happens when they finally build this wall between the earth and the sky. So this afternoon, as I said, I'm going to talk about a few places, a hospital, a church, a lake, and the pyramids. But I'm going to start with um, Mars. And this, is a, this story about Mars has a kind of a strange uh, beginning that started a few years ago. And by the way, this is the first photograph uh, ever taken of Mars. It was taken in the 60s, and since we didn't have cameras back then, this image is made of sound, uh, made from sound, and the image was constructed from the way the sound waves aimed at the planet bounced off and showed us these. Uh, shapes. So the story of Mars started out on kind of a bad day, actually. I was in the studio and, and uh, nothing was was working. It was all just sounding like a lot of static. And the phone rang and a voice said, um, hello, I'm from uh, NASA and we'd like you to be the first artist in residence here. And I said, you're not from NASA. <laughs> I just hung up the phone. You know, when you get a call and it's your fantasy coming true, you know, you don't necessarily believe it. So anyway, they called back and I said, um, no, we were really from NASA and, and we'd like you to be the uh, first artist in residence here. And I said, well, uh, what, is an, uh, what does an artist in residence do? I mean, what does that mean with a space program? And uh, they said they didn't know what that meant and what did I think it meant? And I said, who are you people? 
Now, eventually, I, I decided I was going to take this job, and one of the good things was that there was absolutely no job description. I could just simply make it up, and it was a great opportunity to improvise. Now, actually, I had a job uh, once, uh, a long time ago, that started with a, a big uh, depression. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, uh, but when I saw, before I go back to NASA, as you see, the jump cuts are sort of my best. Uh, when I was um, 26, I had no idea what to do uh, or how to do anything. So I decided to stay in bed uh, until I could think of a really good reason to get up. <laughs> so I stayed in bed for months, and I would just lie there and look at the sky and sort of drift. And at the time, I could afford to do this because I taught at night school, mostly accountants and secretaries who were on the slow track going to school about uh, two nights a week for about 10 years. So I didn't have to get to work until around six in the evening. And mostly the people in the class were really late anyway or else they were just way too tired to concentrate. Now, I was teaching Egyptian architecture and Assyrian sculpture, but I wasn't really keeping up with the Egyptological journals. So uh, a slide would come up in class, and I would look at it, and I would just draw a complete blank. I couldn't remember a single thing about it. Uh, so I would just make things up about <laughs> this or that pharaoh, and uh, the students would write it down, and I would test them on it. I figured so much of history is speculation anyway that it was maybe important to design theories for certain unexplainable things. You know, like, for example, uh, some of these pyramids, there were these holes in the exterior, the size and shape of mailbox slots, and they were connected by a long shaft that ran at an odd angle down into the core of the pyramid, down into the mummy's chamber. And nobody knew why the slots and shafts were there, and so... I, what I told the students was that the slots and shafts were oriented to the sun so that on only one day a year, let's say for the sake of argument, the mummy's birthday, the sun would stream down the shaft and into the inner chamber and shine into the mummy's eyes and wake him up. Now, eventually, I did feel a bit of guilt about this since this was supposedly, you know, a history course and not, you know, free-form fiction. So... I quit, <laughs> not before I was fired, but it was, it was very, very close. So anyway, uh, back to this job at NASA. As I said, there was no description of this artist in residency, so I just had to make it up. And so what I decided to do was just to be kind of like a fly on the wall. And I went around to different NASA centers, Hubble Space Telescope in Baltimore, and Mission Control in Houston, and Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. And I met a lot of people, uh, robotics engineers and astronauts and designers and mathematicians and dreamers and nanotechnologists and people I, I would never meet in the art world. And one of the things I learned was that artists and scientists have a lot more in common than I thought because scientists don't know what they're looking for either. But we work in very, very similar ways. Uh, we get a hunch, and then we make something, and, and then we think, what is this? What, what does this do? And we have to figure out some way uh, in, you know, to use it, or at least somewhere to you know, put it. Uh, and then we have the same question as well. How do you know when you're done? And in order to know when you're, when you're done, you need to know what you're making. So anyway, I'm wandering around NASA with my artist in residence laminated badge with a cartoon rocket on it, and nobody's really <laughs> interested in talking to me, and basically not one single person asked what I was doing there or, or said, artist in residence, do we even have one? I was, uh, <laughs> and I did not take this personally because, you know, since they were really working incredibly hard, and you'll be glad to know, and there are constant deadlines, and it's, you know, like the government at work. And the people... Uh, who did have time on their hands were the nanotechnologists and they were the most kind of theoretical ones and we often talked about uh, how you know when you're when you're finished and they would often cite Einstein 
on this point and said that Einstein rejected some of his most well-known theories. Why? Because he said they weren't beautiful. Now, what, what does that mean? You know, what, what, what exactly was Einstein looking at and what was beauty to him? And uh, what, did, what did that mean? Was it symmetry, for example? Did it have to be symmetrical to be beautiful, perhaps, uh, to be, therefore, true? No, or, uh, anyway, but why symmetry? Because uh, we have two arms, two legs, a bicameral brain. I mean, what is it about this, these, this twinning thing that makes it uh, more beautiful, more meaningful? Uh, uh, this moon, June, two things balancing, why does that make it better? And you know, you take this same idea to Japan and it seems a bit, you know, idiotic. You know, for example, uh, take haiku. There, these are poems that do not compare one thing to another. They don't use this system of rhyming or comparing or doubling uh, or the thing and its meaning. Uh, that's just not where they get their energy. And that there's this, uh, uh, they just have a single thing. For example, a typical haiku would be spring morning, a thaw, the puppeteer coughs. That's it. That's the poem. Um, anyway, making art at NASA was sort of preposterous, really, because they are already making um, giant art projects. Uh, like, for example, the stairway to space, which is, and, and the, the idea of this is to put a series of stacked elevators in the middle of the Pacific, uh, because the most expensive thing about uh, space travel is the blast off. And this huge explosion you have to, to do to make things get off the ground to get above gravity. So the idea is to build these platforms and to hoist the rockets up these stairs, like a series of, of um, platforms and elevators. And then when you get to the top platform, you just simply drive off, you know. And um, anyway, uh, no artist really has to explain why this particular thing, the space elevator, for example, would be uh, oh, considered a work of art. It just would be obvious and it would be accepted in most uh, biennials as, as an artwork. I mean, no question, you know, it's just like, <laughs> yes to technology. Now, I also spent uh, a lot of time at Hubble headquarters in Baltimore, and I got to talk to the people who were interpreting the data from the telescope, and then making images from these numbers. And I have to, uh, and I had been looking at a lot of a very spectacular series of NASA photographs called Stars Being Born in Outer Space. You probably know some of these. And uh, these looked like these towers and mounds of fluffy cumulus clouds, sort of, and pink and blue sunset skies behind them. And they were basically, you know, the colors of, of um, a, a Tiepolo painting. And you could almost see the little cupids darting out from behind the clouds, you know, shooting their arrows and maybe some sort of Disney shooting stars in the back. You know, you could make a wish on it. So I said, you know, so how did you get these colors since, you know, there, there's no actual color in outer space, um, and it's uh, like at all. And at first they said things like, um, kind of dodgy things like, uh, well, yes, every picture in some way is an interpretation. And, and I said, but could you have used a whole different color range, interpreted that baby blue as gray, and maybe that pink is like a brownish purple? I mean, how did you arrive at these colors? And and finally, I, I found the guy who did it, and he said, well, we thought people would like them. And I said, you thought people would like them? Wait a second, I, I'm the artist in residence here. <laughs> and, and by the way, I mean, you know, don't you think this kind of decorative approach you're, you're using could kind of, kind of like a little bit fool people, you know? I mean, they might get the wrong idea about what's going on out there. You know, I mean, this looks like a Tiepolo painting. It looks like exactly like a painting of, you know, of, of, of heaven. Now, I, I think um, NASA asked me to do this project um, because I'm a multimedia artist and and then they thought I might come up with some kind of, you know, sexy techno project like bouncing light off onto one satellite onto another and lighting up the dark side of the moon kind of project. But so when I said I was going to do a long poem, their, uh, their faces really fell. You know, like a, a 
poem. I'm like, why would you do like a, why would you do a poem? Why, you know, uh, which, which got me thinking. I have to say, and, and, and anyway, another big NASA project uh, was a lot like that was a lot like an art project was the greening of Mars. And uh, I walked into a big room at NASA that actually had a huge uh, whiteboard that went all the way around the room. And on the board was a timeline, the outline for the greening of Mars, which has a 10,000 year timeline. And the idea is to add air and plants and water to Mars to make it inhabitable by the time we uh, get there in the distant future. I mean, the fact is that we're going to go somewhere, and Mars is the most likely place. But so we're terraforming Mars, getting ready to go there. And, and now that we know so much about taking care of planets, <laughs> we're going to take care of Mars. A little troubling. Now, the years I was at NASA, where the robot rovers were, were being designed, the Spirit and Opportunity, and they were, these, they were being built and tested, and they were these tiny robots, sort of like uh, the size of little go-karts or big dogs, and we'd take them out to the parking lot and, and drive them around. This is a parking lot in Pasadena. You could see a little bit of Pasadena at the top up there because this is a, the walls of the parking lot were painted to look kind of like Martian, sort of the rocks, sort of like a movie set. Just get in the mood. And anyway, getting to Mars is, of course, it's really hard. It's 300 million miles away and takes about six months, depending on uh, where things are when you launch. And now during this time, there were three missions on the way to Mars, a British, a Japanese, and an American. And the British and Japanese had exploded, and the, the American craft was lost. Uh, and it had been months since anyone had heard from it, so anyone had gotten signals. So on the day that the rovers were supposed to land, all the designers gathered in a big room, and there were, it was about actually this number of people in this room. Uh, and each person had designed a small part of uh, the, the robot, so nobody knew how the whole thing worked. They only knew their own uh, designs, uh, only their small parts. So, uh, since there were no cameras on Mars, uh, we were watching a series of numbers up on the walls that would indicate the status and the location of the, of the craft. And this long series of numbers had completely frozen. And we all sat there watching the frozen numbers uh, for a while, and suddenly they started to move really fast. And then they toggled into a certain pattern that indicated that the craft had entered Martian atmosphere. And everyone was like, whoa. And the next numbers indicated that the parachute had opened and the craft was plummeting down to the surface of the planet. And the next series was showed that there was poof, impact. And the craft had landed in exactly the place the designers had planned. And then it skidded and rolled to a stop. And then the craft unzipped itself, and the little rovers opened their solar panels to the sun and charged up, and then they rolled down the ramp and they began taking 360 degree high resolution images of Mars and sending them back to Earth. And we all went, humans made this. Now one more thing, uh, speaking of other planets and multiple universes and belief systems is that there's this theory that according to the writer Charles Seif, the reason that the Catholic Church uh, does not support scientific research as much as other uh, institutions has to do with certain potentially dangerous discoveries. Like what if they find out that there are lots of planets just like ours, countless Earths just like ours, and if that's true, then there's the possibility that there could be a pope on quite a few of these planets. <laughs> and so then the question is, which pope would be the main pope? The biggest pope? The oldest pope? How would that actually work uh, in terms of hierarchy? Now I should say that although I was the first artist in residence at NASA, I was also the last. <laughs> and there uh, was one of these whistleblowing senators 
And he's looking at the NASA budget, and you know, Congress and NASA are like traditional enemies. It's like the never ending battle between the jocks and the eggheads, and they, they just can't stand each other. Uh, so the senator is reviewing the NASA budget, and he's going, huh, yeah, the three trillion for spy satellites. Excellent. <laughs> a few billion for the new drone heat seeking research. Tip top. And wait, wait a second, there's $20,000 for an artist in residence? This is outrageous. <laughs> what is the government doing supporting the arts? This is ridiculous. Now, I, I, so the, it was canceled. Anyway, I've been trying to reestablish this program, uh, not for myself, but to continue this for someone else, because I, I really think that, that artists have a different way of, of seeing the world, and I think that there should be an artist in residence um, in NASA, and I think there should be an artist in residence in the White House, and artist in residence Supreme Court, artist in residence in Congress, you know, there's a Department of Defense, you know, health and welfare, why not a Department of Art, you know, so anyway, it's one thing that I would like you young artists to, to work on. Um, now one more thing about um, art and technology, uh, before we uh, continue, and that is something that I, I brought along and like to play for you. And uh, it's, um, I've always wanted to sing like a violin, and uh, I found a way to do that, and so this is a little device called a pillow speaker, and it's a small speaker that you put on your pillow at night uh, so that you can do things like learn German in your sleep. Uh, now, this never worked for me. I, I would just <laughs> wake up feeling really paranoid. <laughs> anyway, um, being a somewhat oral person, uh, I have to say I get this kind of thrill of, uh, of in putting electronics in my mouth. So um, this is the way this works. You know, um, a couple of years ago, I was getting an award in an electronic music festival, and instead of a speech, I decided to use this speaker. So I did a rehearsal but uh, uh, in the hotel, but the pillow speaker must have been a little bit old, uh, and because when I put it in my mouth, the speaker glue leaked out, and, and the speaker glued itself to the roof of my mouth. And I couldn't believe it. I, I, I thought, you know, there's, there's acid in the battery. It's going to dissolve the roof of my mouth. You know, and I ran out of the hotel, and I found a drugstore, and I ran into the drugstore, this cable kind of hanging out of my mouth. And I'm saying... Bruh, bruh. 
and ran into the pharmacy section and, and, and I'm gesturing to the pharmacist and you know I'm pretty sure this pharmacist has seen a lot of people running through the door with things stuck in them you know so she didn't panic uh, she just got a q-tip and a little alcohol and just you know kind of pried it out no comment and now some uh, some stories you know you really depend on uh, for your constructing your own identity and a couple of weeks ago I was in um, uh, Sweden and uh, I, w I was very kind of proud of being part Swedish and, uh, and uh, they were I was telling some um, a story about my my grandfather uh, who had always told us that he had um, come from Sweden when he was eight by himself and started a horse business when he was nine and gotten married when he was 10 in Chicago. Everyone was like, eh, you know. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I always thought, oh, well, that's such a romantic story, but probably hiding another story that's probably darker story, like he's a runaway or, you know, some, you know, maybe an orphan or just came back. Why would you make up this story about yourself that was so bizarre? And then uh, the, there was a Swedish TV show uh, last month that said, well, you can get information about your, your, um, your relatives, the, the real story. And in the meantime, I found out from one of my own relatives, something that I could have found out many years ago, was that this story was completely um, uh, fictitious, and he had just made it up. Uh, trying to make, I guess, himself a little bit more interesting because he really came uh, as a, as a one-year-old with his mom and dad to Minnesota where they worked in the mines and started a new life. So anyway, um, one of the things that um, I've kind of depended on in, is, is these, these interesting myths. Uh, and also another one is this kind of story of this sort of sturdy industriousness of being Swedish and our church was called the uh, Swedish Evangelical Mission Covenant Church and it was basically like a, it was a coffee church. You know, we'd, we'd listen uh, to the sermon and then we'd go down to the fellowship room uh, afterwards and get really wired on coffee. You know, and the sermons themselves were just actually really some pretty sensible advice about, you know, being kind to your neighbors, uh, being reasonable, and the rewards that you would immediately get if, if, if for acting that way, as well as a lot of stories that, that Jesus told about wise men and poor men and what to do in certain situations, and really just, you know, how to look at the world, just very, very practical things. Uh, now, later, when I began going to Italy, I looked at a lot of, of paintings and sculptures of Jesus, and they all looked so uh, unfamiliar. And in these paintings, he was never shown talking or gesturing or teaching. He was almost always pictured as a little baby being held by his mother, or else he was dead in her arms. Either way, he was not saying a thing. Now, by that time, I was doing a lot of work in Italy, and I, and I often got booked into churches which were uh, used as theaters when there weren't services going on. So I'd set up all my equipment, keyboards and amps and speakers on these big golden altars. And it was really eerie doing these shows, knowing that right behind me the whole time was an enormous, well-lit plaster cast of the crucifixion. So one night, I, I made what was actually a kind of a tasteless joke. And the joke was, why is it a good thing that Jesus was born in New Testament times instead of Old Testament times? And the answer is that in Old Testament times, death was by stoning, and that in New Testament times, death was by crucifixion. So instead of people going like this, they were all be going like <laughs> this, which would have changed a lot of things about architecture, for example. You know, the buildings would be just not the cross-shaped ground plans. They'd be sort of strewn all over, like much, much more abstract. <laughs> now, I try very hard not to be sentimental. But uh, remembering things is also forgetting things. And, and I uh, 
did a, a film, as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, called Heart of a Dog, and, and one of the stories uh, was a, about a story. This, this film was uh, commissioned by uh, Arte TV, which is a French-German channel, and they asked me to do a film about why do you make art? And I was like, wow. This is a no, sort of no-budget series, and usually the artist gets a camera, trains it at a candle for 25 minutes, and does a long voiceover, and you just see the candle flickering, and you hear, Lacan, you know, so on. And I like this kind of art film. I'm a sucker for it. I really love listening to this um, theoretical uh, uh, um, s rambling. And... Um, it's uh, so. Also, I think uh, but it was an odd project because I think they just forgot that they had commissioned this film because they never called me say, "How's the film going?" No, I, I never. It was so I got to finish it like a hobby, you know, and just work on it whenever I felt like it a little bit, and then it doesn't really matter if I finished or not. So I highly recommend this uh, attitude towards. <laughs> doing things, if you can possibly arrange it, because it's so much better than, the time's running out, what's the film about, you know, when are we getting it, and we gotta get it out. So, anyway, um, the, the film uh, turned out to be a lot about um, various uh, ways that uh, memory works, really. And it's, um, it was um, also based on, the center of the film was a, uh, a, a look at um, time as it's described in the Bardo, something we talked earlier about uh, this afternoon. And this was a, um, a series of, of many different th works that I did about this. And one was um, looking at the Bardo from the point of view of a, of a dog. So I did a lot of very, very large um, drawings of, of my dog going to the bardo, which is the 49-day period that in which the Tibetans believe that the uh, consciousness uh, dissolves and, uh, and the energy prepares to enter another life form. And much of, uh, of it is an investigation of the senses, so it's very interesting for musicians and uh, artists to read about as as um, the importance of, of hearing, for example, which the Tibetan Buddhists really um, emphasize in terms of hearing being the last sense to go as you, as you die, so that uh, when the eyes go out, when it gets dark and your heart, uh, flatline, uh, your heart stops and your brain flatlines, the, the hammers in the ears, they believe, are still working, so they believe that you should shout instructions about what to do uh, and use that last sense that's holding on. So they, they yell into the dying person's ear, you're dead, you're dead now. <laughs> you will see two lights. Do not go to the near one, go to the far away. They give very clear instructions. As you move through this 49 day period uh, and, and things begin to happen. So I was very fascinated with, with their description of uh, the Dissolution of the of consciousness. So uh, I showed it through a dog's pers perspective. And these were a series of very big paintings that were um, 11 by 14 feet, just charcoal drawings of um, my dog going to um, the bardo. And whoops, that's not what we want to see. There we go. Um, Let's see. Let's go to the next one. Uh, I'll just quickly go through through these. Um, and some of them figured in the film. Uh, this is uh, one in which uh, the uh, as you disintegrate, there's an enormous thirst and and memory uh, is is sort of imploding and and sound becomes um, incredibly intense. This is also a, a, a scene from my, uh, my dog did learn how to play the piano. This is a, my dog, Lolabelle. Um, and she did because uh, she went blind, and a lot of dogs do very well uh, when they're blind. It is, they're, they're seeing is not, they're, they're, their vision is not very good anyway. Their hearing is excellent. Their noses tell them a lot of, get them a lot of information. But Lolabelle, when she went blind, she sort of froze in place. 
She wouldn't move. She, we had to pick her up to do, take her to her water bowl, pick her up to take her to the bed, take, take, pick her up to take her to a walk. So uh, I, I contacted a, I, I was, I didn't know what to do. I did not necessarily want a piano playing dog. <laughs> that wasn't my goal, uh, but I called a trainer and I said, what are we going to do, uh, what can we do? Um, and she said, um, I taught my dogs to play piano. And I said, why? <laughs> but anyway, uh, she um, uh, taught Lola Bell to play, and, and uh, she played every day for two years, and, uh, and about an hour a day. And the thing about music is that it's a very physical thing. It fills the room. And so all of the things that she lost through sight, because she was a very vision-focused animal, uh, she gained by having the, the sound hit the walls and people came over to the studio every day and at lunchtime she'd do a concert and it was a way of bringing people into her sphere and, and I'd have to say that music saved her life and I think a, a lot of musicians would say the same. And so here are some other scenes from this which appear in the uh, uh, sort of short stories, as I said before, about, about sound and, and um, clamor and um, confusion and identity. And um, I am going to read you one of the stories that is in the middle of, of the film. And it's a, a thing called a story about a story. And then uh, we are going to move into the Q&A part of, of the afternoon, which will be 10 to 15 minutes um, of talking about whatever you would like. Uh, so this is the story that is in the middle and is called A Story About a Story. A true story, as these all are not, particularly because it's not a, like, uh, because I want you to get to know me particularly, it's just about the way things work. And you know how everyone has their go-to kid stories, you know, if somebody says, what kind of kid were you? You, you have a short story. Um, you know, I was a bookworm, or I was a, you know, mama's boy, I was a sport, or whatever, you know, and and uh, they're very short, and they're, you know, and people are not asking you because they actually really want to know, of course, it's just a social glue, you know, unless your shrink says, tell me about your childhood, then you're, the stories are longer, you know, but in this case, this, this, this is a story about a story, so here's how it goes. I want to tell you a story about a story. And it's about the time I discovered that most adults have no idea what they're talking about, and also that they have no problem saying whatever comes to mind, whether it's even vaguely true or not. Now, it was the middle of the summer when I was 12 years old, and I was the kind of kid who was always showing off. I have seven brothers and sisters, and I was always kind of getting lost in the crowd. And I would do practically anything for attention. So one day, I was at the swimming pool, and I decided to do a flip from the high board, and the kind of dive when you're temporarily magically suspended midair, and everyone around the pool goes, wow, that's incredible, that, that's amazing. Now, I'd never done a flip before, but I thought, how hard can it be? You just, you know, somersault, straighten out right before you hit the water, and, and so I did, but I missed the pool, and I landed, poof, on the concrete edge, and I broke my back. Now I spent the next few months in traction in the children's ward at the hospital, and for quite a while I couldn't move or talk. And I was just sort of floating. And I was in the same unit with the kids who'd been burned, and they were hanging in these rotating slings, sort of like rotisseries or spits, that would turn you around and around so that the burns could be bathed in these cool liquids. Then one day, one of the doctors came to see me, and he told me that I wouldn't be able to walk again. And I remember thinking, this guy is crazy. I mean, is he even a doctor? Who knows? Although I couldn't say that or anything else since I couldn't talk. But I was sure that he had no idea what he was saying. Of course I was going to walk. I, I, I just had to concentrate, keep trying to make contact with my feet, convince them, will them to move. Now the worst thing about this was the volunteers who came every afternoon to read to me and they'd lean over the bed and they'd say, hello, Lori, really enunciating each word as if I'd also gone deaf. 
And they would open the book. So, where were we? Oh, yes. The gray rabbit was hopping down the road, and guess where he went? Well, nobody knows. The farmer doesn't know. The farmer's wife doesn't know. The farmer's son doesn't know. And on and on like this. Nobody knew where the rabbit had gone, but just about everybody seemed to care. Now, before this happened, I'd been reading books like Tale of Two Cities and Crime and Punishment. So the gray rabbit stories were kind of a slow torture. Anyway, eventually I did get on my feet, and then for two years I wore a huge metal brace, and I was kind of a Frankenstein design. And I was basically a, a freak, and I got very obsessed with John F. Kennedy, as you know, because he had back problems too, and he was the president. Now much later in my life, when someone would ask what my childhood was like, sometimes I would tell them the story about the hospital, and it was a short way of telling them certain things about myself. How I had learned not to trust certain people, and how horrible it was to listen to long, pointless stories, like the one about the gray rabbit. But there was always something weird about telling this story that, that made me very uneasy. Like something was missing. Then one day, I was in the middle of telling it, and I was describing the little rotisseries that the, that the kids were hanging in, and suddenly, it was like I was back in the hospital, exactly the way it had been. And I remembered the missing part. It was the way the ward sounded at night. It was the sounds of all the children crying and screaming. It was the sounds the children make when they're dying. And then I remembered the rest of it. The heavy smell of medicine. The smell of burnt skin. How afraid I was. And the way some of the beds would be empty in the morning and the way the nurses would never talk about what had happened to these kids. They would just keep going on making out the beds and cleaning up around the ward. And so the thing about this story was that actually I'd only told the part about myself, and I'd forgotten the rest of it. I'd cleaned it up just the way the nurses had. And that's what I think is the creepiest thing about stories. You try to get to the point you're making, usually something about yourself or something you learned, and you get your story, and you hold on to it. And every time you tell it, you forget it more. Thank you. And now, Okay, we have time for a few questions. Would anyone like to start? Hi. Um, I would like to know what kind of work structure or discipline uh, on a daily basis or however you do it that you impose upon yourself to produce work. It depends on the project, um, but thanks for asking because it's always a struggle to find the right way to work on things that also allow for uh, having fun with them. But uh, it's uh, right now I'm doing a lot of writing, so that is that, that's a grind, you know. And so I've found that the best way to do that is, you know, I've asked my writer friends, and they just say, just sit there chill and then if you haven't written anything at the end of that four hours or five hours however much time you've blocked out just leave so that's hard for me because I'm kind of a hands-on person I, I began my training was as, as a sculptor and so I like to to make stuff so uh, it's hard to not start you know tearing the paper up and making little diagrams of things any rather than so uh, it's um uh, I think it's a combination of trying to to um, have uh, enough room so that you can have a, a good time, but also 
so that you have enough time to actually uh, um, uh, practice it and try to, to make something. So. Okay, great. We have another question. Hi. Okay. Um, so I watched um, Heart of a Dog last week on HBO, and it was, it was really nice in the midst of all this screaming that's going on. Uh, so I wanted to see if you would say a little bit about uh, Lola Bell's revelation, uh, you know, at this time when everybody wants things to get back to normal and this election to be over. And the other, the other thing was um, the point that you made uh, in, in the film where your teacher, your, your teacher said um, you have to try to um, feel sad without being sad. That's really different than a Christian perspective where the actual suffering is important. So could you address those things? Sure. Um, well, first of all, so uh, the um, question you had about Lola Bell and, and I, I guess it was just, uh, I suppose in a way things I'd learned from her, uh, for one thing, I mean one thing I, I learned from Lola Bell was how to, to be old. And she was just a magnificent old dog, and she just kind of like began slowing down and basking more. And I thought, oh, that's how you do it. So that was a that was a wonderful thing to learn from an animal. Also, uh, animals have wonderful ways that they do poetry. And uh, also, uh, the other thing I suppose I admire most about dogs is is their ability to have empathy. And I, as an artist, I aspire to, to that more, probably more than anything else is, what is it like to see things from a different point of view? I'm kind of stuck in my worldview of artist, New Yorker, woman, you know, and that's kind of the way I see the world. But as an artist and a writer, I would like to try to make that a broader view. Uh, so uh, empathy is, is one of the many things that the, the film is, is about, but that's the central thing. And the teaching of um, Minga Rinpoche is, as you mentioned, uh, we talked about that earlier today, um, is um, he's a uh, Tibetan teacher and he is uh, uh, someone whose work I, I very much admire. And it's, uh, it's very much about suffering as well. Uh, as well as many traditions uh, come from that um, uh, starting point. And his, but his idea with that is, um, uh, as you said, uh, one of his teachings is trying to practice how to feel sad without being sad. Not the easiest thing to do. And his point is also, basically there are many sad things in the world. And if you push them away, if you pretend that they're not there, you're an idiot. They are there, and they will just, they will get you. And so, what his teaching is, because you understand them and can hold them, doesn't mean you need to become them. He was voted the happiest man in the world. I know, you didn't know that that was a position, but <laughs> the University of Madison, Wisconsin has a neurological department that measures, let's call it, equilibrium, happiness, happiness, let's say, the ability to, to be here and hold difficult things, joy and happiness, as well as suffering and pain, and, and without becoming all of those things. So uh, this is, is the teaching that I, I really uh, uh, like very much because uh, in, in certain ways, of course, we're, we're born with a, a lot of characteristics. We, we inherit them from our, our parents, too. But a lot, a lot of these things, we can also decide. And when I talk to young artists, I often talk about this because, you know, uh, for one thing, you know, they, uh, they think, well, you know, let's take it from the point of view of, like, oh, I can't call myself an artist because artists are like Van Gogh. Um, how could I call myself an artist? And, and I have to say, you know, uh, I hate to tell you this, but not that many people care what you call yourself. <laughs> Think about it. You know, they care about you. You care about uh, that as much as is is they care about what what you call yourself. Knock yourself out. Call yourself anything. You know, it's okay. Um, but it it becomes a way of designing your own uh, view of the world as well. And I think artists are are very good at that uh, uh, as well. So that. Here's another example. 
Let's say something happens to you and you really want to scream. You just want to, ah, ah. But you say, you know, I'm not the kind of person who would scream. I'm just not a screamer. I don't scream. But the problem is you still want to scream. So I see that in essentially as a kind of design problem, that you have to then go back into the, your personality design that you made, largely. Okay, your parents shaped it, but you did all the you know, wood paneling on that stuff, you know? <laughs> it's like, you finished it off. Uh, so go back in and make that design a little bit bigger so that you can scream if you feel like screaming, you know. So anyway, uh, that's, um, I suppose, one of the things that uh, I, I think that the Tibetan teachers and, and many teachers in many, many traditions uh, try to, we were talking earlier too about F. Scott Fitzgerald, who gave some advice to young writers, and he said, try to imagine you're holding two things. They are one in each hand. They are both absolutely two and absolutely the opposite of each other. And try to hold them both without going crazy. That's what it is to be a human being. You, know, you don't have to average them out and water them down and make that, you can hold them both without going crazy. So the, there, there's a lot of conflict in the world, a lot of things that, that seem to be the opposite. And they happen also, they're, they're all connected to stories that are, are true from that point of view. I think we've seen that in the election. They're true from those points of view. So the person who's telling the, is, who's the narrator is from their best vantage point trying to tell their story and you have to respect that. You have to respect that, that, that they're not just making it up from somewhere. It's a story that they're telling. And that there are many, many, we live in just a, a, a world of refracted light that, that we have all sorts of different experiences. So the point is to try to listen to those stories, really listen to them and not just be kind of knee jerk. When I, I, I was doing some shows in Athens on the day of Brexit and I went, I uh, got on the plane the night of when the UK was in the EU and, and I got up and, and got off the plane and like everybody else's phone is dur, 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 Brexit, Brexit, you know, I was like, whoa. So I was in Athens and I was doing a, some concerts there and the first seven people that I talked to, I said, whoa, kind of panicking. What do you think about Brexit and how could they do that? And they thought it was so great. And, and, they all said the same thing. They said, well, I have to think about it. I was like, I'm in the land of philosophers. <laughs> you know, this is incredible. I have to think about it. Not just some kind of like, you know, Twittery, knee-jerk thing that just, it's bad, it's good. It's, you know, label it right away. Just, you know, don't only see it from your point of view. You know, they, they, uh, uh, and what I was, I had a job once uh, as the only American on the opening ceremony uh, committee, which was two years of thinking with these Greek artists. And um, it was amazing because uh, I had never been in a room with people who were such sharp thinkers. And I thought, well, there's no doubt in my mind why these people came up with everything, <laughs> you know, all at once. But I did have a question uh, about that because... Um, and I was given a tutor because we were supposed to incorporate Greek uh, uh, themes in, into the open cer opening ceremony. And my tutor was the and head chief archaeologist uh, at the Parthenon. He was in charge of putting the Parthenon back together. Since the 18th century explosion, they're still putting the pieces together with tweezers. And I had this question, and I, and it seemed like a naive question. I was very afraid to ask it. Uh, but he seemed like, this guy, you know, uh, I thought he would be able to answer it mainly because he looked pretty much exactly like Plato. So I thought, you know, I so should probably know the answer. And I, I, asked, I asked this question, I said, listen, you know, how can it be that everything here was invented, you know, um, history, um, uh, 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 um, uh, architecture, sculpture, algebra, poetry, a sculpt, you know, everything in, in this giant explosion. It just, and, and what happened? I mean, 
why aren't we a thousand times smarter now? Why didn't we just keep building and building and building on this? And what happened here? And he said, okay, I'll tell you. I was like, really, you know the answer? <laughs> he said, well, yeah. He said, in that time uh, of when all of those things were being invented, uh, the uh, people would come to uh, bring uh, offerings to Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, to the Parthenon. And they would bring these offerings, offerings of statues, kuroi, that were t the athletes were taking one step, almost Egyptian in, in their primitive way of just first step, very crude statues, and they would put them all around, and then gradually the statues got more lifelike, and they would curve around, and they'd be looking at you, and they'd be like going like, Kua, and uh, it began to be a kind of, um, eventually sort of uncurated biennale, you know, with everything just parked all over. And he said, people came to that, and they, and they said something, and this, uh, this I will never forget. He said, you know, um, it's just not possible to worship in an art museum. I was like, whoa. Now that's sunk into my brain, and I'm still processing that many years later. Is it possible to worship in an art museum? What are you worshiping? You know, what, what, are, you look, what are you looking for? And so anyway, um, and I thought, how is it possible that belief systems trump the uh, need to know? And then I thought, wait a second. You know, I, I live in a country where where uh, what we believe in is primary, you know, and that's supposed to be even more important than what we learn by investigating what's really happening. So what we just gut believe, you know. So anyway, uh, let's take another question <laughs> or a comment. Could be uh, a yes. comment. Yes. Yes. Well, on one of the, your older works, I remember you were on a plane with a lady who had never flown before and she, you were listening to her descriptions and she, what were actually towns that she was looking at, she described them as stars. And I always remember how what you took away from that was this sense that you wanted to appreciate what she saw and her sense of wonder. And I, and I wanted to connect that to your awareness and your sense of inspiration, how would, you would describe how inspiration strikes you. Well, um, yeah, perspective is, is uh, a, a big thing for me. And that's one of the reasons that I, I'm, very interested in um, virtual reality is that, that your ability to change your point of view like that, you know, and in a very convincing way is really exciting to me. So any kind of art form that lets you be free, basically, you know, to uh, jump out of your own mindset, you know, and see things from an, even just another, that's why I also use the dynamics of conversation and duet off, often. In, in, I'm a, a, an artist who's got stuck in some sort of monologue situation, so I try to put, uh, when I can, the dynamics of, of two in, uh, into, into the work, and because it gives it a little more energy of just back and forth, and, and, uh, and it's a, I'm also a, um, uh, very interested in, in martial arts, and uh, one of the things about that is, uh, of course, the, is the duality of, of those, uh, of yin and yang, and, and the push and pull of, of things, and working with, basically, I mean, well, you know a lot of the moves, and I'm sure some of you are, are studying martial arts as well, and you know that some of these beautiful moves, like this one, you know, you see, do uh, um, people um, in the park, you know, what is that, that thing? Well, that, that's decapitation. <laughs> it's a martial art, you know. <laughs> so, you know, but it, it's one that that is um, with the absent partner. You know, you're always all of these things have applications. So that if you're doing this, it really is, or this, which you think is a beautiful yin yang thing, is uh, basically twisting someone's head off, <laughs> and then you kick it away this way, like a soccer move, I'm like. Another question? Sure, one more from the back, maybe? Is there any questions back here? All right, we'll come around this way. Hello. Hello. Um, 
I was curious about the pillow speaker, actually. I hadn't seen one of those in many years. I used to work in talking books, and I believe a couple of our patrons um, had those. And so I was curious about what, um, I guess, what drew you to it as a musical instrument? What what brought you to that, or was it just something you decided to pop in your mouth one day and, well, and experiment with? Yeah, there's a couple of <laughs> things. One is um, one is sleep and sleeplessness and stories. And uh, I, I originally uh, got the, also they're cheap. I love cheap stuff, and I live on Canal Street in New York, and and they have they used to have it was used to be the best electronics place in the in the city, and so I just go and get cheap electronics and try to fix it and do stuff with it. So the cheap part was was appealing. The sleep part was also appealing because um, uh, I, I liked the idea of, of making stories for transitions as you're falling to sleep, especially with kids too who are a little bit hesitant, you know, like you're falling into where? Into this other world where what could happen? Just almost anything. So, trying to think of it as as a drop that was magical and wonderful, and this wonderful privilege that you could go into this dark realm where anything could happen, and you were like had this wonderful control was was a way to just make music for for people who would be falling, you know, uh, falling asleep. And so, uh, I also was asked to, by Philip Stark, the, the designer, to. Uh, design a hundred of his hotels, be the art director of a hundred of his hotels. And I said, that's so weird. What are you talking about? And he said, well, you can make, you can make theaters in the, in the basis of these. You can, you can have stories in all the guests' pillows. You can have, um, do video in the elevators. You can do books. You can do whatever. And I said, whoa, that sounds... You know, it was such a bizarre left field thing, but I'm interested in these kind of things because he'd also, he started by saying, first of all, I want you to make one of my lobbies sound bigger. I was like, okay. And you know, when you walk into some place, let's say, let's take a hotel lobby as a good, as a good example, sometimes a little bit on the dark side, but you really, you hear how big the lobby is before you look up and right, you hear this, it's really dark or cozy or expansive. Or, Grand and so, uh, making it bigger was was fairly easy to do because you just add some a little bit of reverb to the thing and it sounds a little bit bigger, you know. And so, um, anyway, f from that he said, okay, now I want you to design a hundred hotels. And I said, you're not serious. And he said, I am. I said, okay, then my fee is going to be one hundred of my friends will be able to stay in any of your hotels for as long as they like for the rest of their lives. <laughs> And he said, agreed. I was like, oh, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> So I, I, did, I actually did this for a couple of weeks, and I realized that, before that I realized that I would have to give up absolutely everything. Um, not just my uh, work, but my private life, everything. Because it's just, it's like, it's like sometimes working on a film score, you know, if I'm, uh, films, uh, you know, the last thing that they, they, they always run out of money by the time they do the, the soundtrack. So they, they ask you to do the soundtrack and you're, even before you've said yes, you're over budget and you're late. <laughs> and so I said, wait, man, I just haven't even said yes to this yet. I can't be over budget. I said, no, you're over budget already. I was like, wow, this is crazy. So I did not uh, take that job in the end, but... Um, uh, is there one last question? Because I know that we're uh, way over All time. right, one last question, and then we'll wrap up. Thank you so much for sharing your extraordinary gift. Uh, my question is about um, y young children. So I have this these new grandchildren, and one of them is four years old, and she shows an amazing gift from really not talking till she's almost four telling stories, long, you know. So I wondered if you thought there was a way to encourage storytelling or guide it or just let it be. Well, I, I think it's, it's um, I'm not an expert on this at all, but I would say that, uh, that um, appreciating uh, a, a little kid's uh, stories is a, 
a really good first way to go, like listening to them. Um, they, re they are tapped into some pretty crazy things. <laughs> no, they're really like, uh, I can say, uh, they're, they're pretty free. And uh, so I think um, appreciating that and then, and then reciprocating also, and just be coming, being part of the game because it's, it's a, uh, uh, it's a, language is a, uh, is a game. And it's when it's done really, you know, if you're finding a, a, a partner who you can really talk with and you know what it, that feels like, it's just the greatest tennis match. Bum, 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 bum. It's really, it really can be great. And I, and I think if children learn that early, that it's fun to talk and that they're allowed to talk, uh, it, it's, um, it's a really uh, uh, a great thing. And, and, but I also think um, there are just so many uh, voices that we have, that it, it's important to to encourage children to find find theirs and not just adopt one that's around. So, and as I was trying to 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 tell you in the in this story about um, that I was reading to you a story about a story, we're all narrators of our lives, and we're maybe not the best narrators in a certain way. You know, I I told we tell basically the thing is we tell the stories that we can tell, and so. The, when you tell a story about yourself, as I'm telling the story of my 12-year-old self in a hospital, um, uh, I was not really able to tell a story uh, that was about children and the sound of them dying. I could not tell. Uh, there was not something a, a child like that can, even 12, can articulate. I couldn't tell the story that my family didn't come and see me in the hospital. I couldn't, you know, there's the things you just can't say. And adults, in, in the end, are kind of idiots if they put all the children together and children are like tuned into each other and what's going on. They know exactly what's going on if, if that kind of screaming is happening. They're not, so, uh, and, and then you remember it the rest of your life without being able to articulate it because at that time you're not able to. So one of the um, uh, ways of learning to, to express yourself is to find that, you, that, that sometimes you become your own narrator, and who is that telling that story? One of the reasons that I used very fast words in the film that I made called Heart of a Dog, something's very rapid fire stuff, it was a, it was a program that I invented to um, uh, be, trigger uh, written language by spoken language. In other words, so that, that you could... Um, uh, I can't set it up, up for you now, but just imagine that if uh, that right now you're reading some other text that's being triggered by what I'm saying. It's very, very fast, and it's about a completely different subject matter. So that you are suddenly splitting your mind into uh, what you're seeing. That's my phone. Excuse me, I'm not going to get it. splitting your mind and what you're seeing and what you're hearing, which we do all the time. You're having a conversation with someone and you're going, why is her hair like that? But you're, meanwhile, <laughs> you're, da, 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 you know. we're very used to doing that multitasking. We're very, very good at it. But on the other hand, you know, um, this, this fast language was addressed to the part of you that, that never speaks. The part of you that's always back there kind of observing and is a little bit on the often critical side. You know, it's kind of going, like, for example, like mine right now is going, you should really wrap this up, you know. It's like, just, uh, you're getting a little pompous, you know. And just, you know, uh, but you know what I'm talking about, that one who's there. So, so I think, like, with, with children who are telling stories, you know, you have to also say, like, who are you when you're telling that one? Because you can have a lot of fun uh, when, you, when you kind of jump out of yourself. So... Um, that said, I'm going to thank you all very much for coming, and I'll see you at the reception. Thank you.